In the last video, we talked about nuclear fission as an energy source, uh, and that is when you split an atom in order to release energy, convert some of the mass of the atom into energy. There is also another form of nuclear energy that exists, which is called fusion, and this occurs when you take two nuclei, two different kinds of atoms, and you force them together with enough power that they combine together to form a single atom. So you're taking two smaller bits and you're jamming them together. And this also releases gobs and gobs and gobs of energy. In fact, way more energy than fission releases. So if we could harness fusion as a form of energy, that would actually create a lot more energy for us than, uh, than fission does. Uh, and what if I told you there is a fusion reactor that we can utilize right now, which every single day gives us enough energy uh, to power all human energy consumption for 27 years. 27 years worth of energy every single day. That is what the sun is. It is a massive fusion engine. The sun is a miasma of incandescent plasma, a glowing nuclear furnace where hydrogen is fused into helium at temperatures of millions of degrees. To paraphrase, they might be giants. Solar energy comes in two flavors. We have passive solar and active solar. Passive solar means that we're designing buildings in such a way that we're gonna maximize their capture of sunlight during the winter months, but so that we can still keep them cool during summer. There's a lot of neat tricks you can use with passive solar. Uh, planting deciduous trees. During the summer, they're going to have full leaves, so you're going to have a lot of shade. During the winter, they'll have dropped their leaves and they'll let more sunlight in and hit the house. So you can control how much sunlight is entering the house or, or uh, is shaded from the house by planting trees in a clever way. South-facing windows. This is a classic passive solar technique because in the northern hemisphere, uh, since we are north of the equator and the sun is generally in line with the equator, it's whether it's you know east in the sky or west in the sky, it's going to be a little bit south of us at all times. So having south-facing broad windows is going to maximize sunlight capture. Uh, absorbent materials, for example, uh, using dark-colored materials. If you've ever worn a black T-shirt on a on a bright sunny day, uh, you might know that you feel a lot hotter as a result, and that's because dark pigments absorb uh, light energy, and they re-radiate it out as infrared light heat energy. Uh, so we can use that principle to our advantage, and the opposite goes for light-colored materials. They reflect light off of them, so if you wear a, like a white-colored t-shirt on a hot sunny day, it's going to reflect most of the sun's light and you're not going to be nearly as hot as if you were wearing a dark colored t-shirt. So using a combination of these uh, ideas, you can design a building or a house in such a way that you can reduce both the money and energy investment that you need to put into your home heating and cooling system. And air conditioning and heating is one of the major uses of energy that we have. Like, that is a big portion of everyone's electric bill is the air conditioner and the heating system. Or uh, if you don't have uh, electric heating, the, you know, the oil bill or the natural gas bill that you pay. That's a lot of what our energy needs are, just making sure to maintain temperature inside our buildings. In other words, a well-designed building with the uh, landscape and the position of the sun and, and all this in mind can just generate free money or it can save you a lot of money that you otherwise would have spent. But typically when I say solar energy, solar power, people think about solar panels, right? And that's active solar, the use of electronic devices to focus, move, or store solar energy. So typically a solar panel is a uh, dark plate, again, dark materials absorb sunlight, they absorb light energy, uh, and they are going to be encased in glass. Uh, and we're going to talk about the construction of solar panels, the, the exact science behind how they work. And they're typically mounted on roofs uh, in order to maximize sun exposure. One big difference between solar power and all the other methods of energy production that we talk about is that there's no point in solar power where we are spinning a turbine in order to induce an electric current. In solar panels, 
the light is directly absorbed by electrons in the material and those electrons are placed into an excited state means they're more active more likely to move around they rare to go in these wires they are ready to move around on their own and it's the the way these solar panels are constructed that makes it kind of like those diodes i mentioned before you remember when i was talking about diodes and circuits a diode is a device that only allows a an electric current to move in a single direction through the device so the solar panel itself behaves as a diode which means the light is charging up the electrons and then the solar panel only allows the electrons to move in one direction and this creates a electric current the electrons are moving around the system in a single direction you can plug a battery right into a solar panel with no moving parts required here are some other advantages of solar power you can just take a solar panel and take it to a remote location set it up angle it so it's going to get good sunlight and you have electricity you do not need to burn anything to get it you do not need any kind of refinery in order to get the petroleum right like those kind of materials you don't need a enormous nuclear reactor facility none of that kind of concern you get a solar panel you can get solar energy and that can be transported to any given location so even uh, rural villages in uh, less developed areas they can have electricity running there. They, they have access in some cases to laptops and even to um, sometimes satellite internet and those kind of things uh, because they have some solar panels that have been brought to the village in order to generate the electricity for these things. Not all, obviously, but in some cases. I have a little fold-out solar panel that I take with me when I'm uh, backpacking, which you just kind of unfold it and then you can plug your cell phone into it and it charges up your cell phone. It works okay um, I wouldn't say that I'm a huge fan I think it could probably be improved but it, it's very portable technology capturing sunlight with a solar panel and then using it to induce an electric charge generates no greenhouse gases no pollutants of any kind that doesn't mean that there is zero carbon footprint associated with solar power though because those solar panels had to be created in a factory those those machines also needed a power source of their own uh, the materials had to be mined and extracted from somewhere so anything any material product that we create has a, a carbon footprint associated with it there's transportation costs like the solar panels had to be shipped in trucks and planes and boats obviously so there's some carbon footprint associated with solar uh, but it is not going to be even remotely close to those of, say, like fossil fuels. The net energy yield from solar is... Eh, it's, it's medium. It's low to medium. Uh, and there's a lot of things that that depends on. Uh, there are going to be some areas that get a longer daily amount of sun exposure than others. So if you're closer to the equator, you're getting very long... Uh, stretches of daylight every single day and it's not affected by seasons where it, the closer you are to the poles the more seasons are going to affect how much daylight you have uh, and the more uh, of an extreme angle the sun's going to be hitting you at but even in the best case scenario low to medium that energy yield the technology is improving they have really dramatically improved over the past couple decades the quality of solar panels and as I mentioned way earlier on in this unit, it is a growth uh, area for the energy industry. Lots of new jobs are being created in solar, and it is currently the largest number of jobs in the energy industry for renewables. And you don't just see them on like rooftops. Uh, if you walk out into Marple Campus's parking lot, you'll see these emergency phones, and they each have their own solar panel on top of them so they can be used to power things that are kind of far away from the main power source of your uh, whatever outlet uh, you happen to be on whatever facility you're in uh, so that's one good use of solar panels and then over here you don't need actually high technology to utilize solar energy take a look at this thing this is a parabolic uh, or I should just say a concave metallic surface it's highly reflective it's been kind of polished and it just reflects the sun rays the sun's rays 
to a point underneath this tea kettle. And it's kind of like using a magnifying glass, right? You can set fire to a leaf if you have a magnifying glass and you angle it with the sun uh, pretty quickly, actually. And this is the same principle, You're just focusing the sun's energy to a point underneath this tea kettle and that will start boiling it uh, as a little cooker. You don't need to set up a fire or anything like that. You just have this ready to go uh, source of, of heat uh, available to you. These are really popular in Nepal. Now you might think that that's, you know, uh, yes, it's a form of solar energy. It's a little bit silly though, right? But take that idea. What if we expanded that on a much, much bigger scale? I give you Nevada's Crescent Dune Solar Energy Project. You have all of these mirrors. That's what these little flashy objects are around the, uh, the outside of here. And they're arranged in circles, concentric circles, around this core at the, at the center. And this core contains molten salt. So all of these mirrors have little servo motors on them, and they are meant to track the sun so that they are constantly reflecting the sun's light at this one central point. So throughout the day as the sun moves, they are constantly readjusting themselves in order to make sure that they maintain the focus of energy right here. And it heats up the molten salt to an extremely high temperature, I mean, it would have to be to get molten salt. We're almost talking about like lava. We're taking a rock and we're turning it liquid here with so much heat. Uh, and it gets drained into this, uh, see the silver cylinder down here, this large containment facility. That is where the molten salt eventually gets kind of uh, drained into and concentrates. So you get lots and lots of heat right there. And you might know where I'm going with this already. Uh, in this facility, and this is unusual for solar, they use the heat in order to turn a turbine in order to generate uh, electricity. So they, they you know, use steam and then the steam turns a turbine and then uh, they, they get electric current. Now why would they do that? Why, why don't they just use solar panels around here uh, in order to capture the sunlight uh, and then turn that directly into electric current? And it is related to one of the major cons for solar energy. I told you every kind of energy source has pros and cons. One of the big cons for solar is storage. You see, every other kind of power source that we talked about, nuclear, coal, petroleum, natural gas, those are the ones we've kind of covered so far, they can be burning uh, 24 hours a day. Solar is only available when the sun's out. So when the sun's gone, you're not generating any new electricity. So the solar panels, right, as soon as the sun's gone, they're not creating any electricity. So what you would have to do is generate so much electricity during the day and then store it someplace so that you can kind of let it go throughout the rest of the evening, right? So you'd have to build like a giant battery. And that's effectively what this molten salt storage system is. They're capturing the heat and this silver containment area down here, this little thing, it's like a big thermos, right? It, like if you have a really good thermos, you pour hot coffee into it, it'll still be hot the next day, uh, like 24 hours later, as long as you don't open it up. So they can continue to utilize that heat to keep generating electricity from the solar energy throughout the night. And then by the time it starts to cool off a little bit, the sun is back up and they can go back to heating it up again. So this facility in Nevada is actually able to create 24-hour solar energy as, uh, as a result of this kind of clever design. Now you might think, why not just charge up some enormous batteries, right, with, with uh, solar panels? Um, but the solar panels ha would have a much larger um, environmental cost for production than the mirrors would, uh, and batteries contain battery acid. They contain um, nasty uh, chemicals and metals inside of them. Um, they have to be disposed of eventually, and that and disposing of electronics is a, a kind of big environmental problem as well, which again we'll talk about in Unit 5. So this is actually a very environmentally uh, clean, a very environmentally friendly way to get 24-hour power out of solar energy. But once more, when I say solar energy, you guys are probably thinking solar panels, right? So let's talk about solar panels. How do they work? 
Solar panels are made out of arrangements of photovoltaic cells. So if you understand how these photovoltaic cells work, then you understand how the entire solar panel works. And each photovoltaic cell is made from three layers of material. You have the top layer, which is made of phosphorus enriched silicon. So you have a lot of phosphorus in here. Phosphorus uh, has a generally forms negatively charged ions, which means they have an abundance of electrons on them. So there's excess electrons here. And electrons are moving electrons is what is electric current, right? So we're at a good start here. And the sunlight hits that phosphorus enriched layer, charging up the electrons. And here's the photovoltaic part. The photovoltaic effect is that sunlight can be, or any kind of light really, can be absorbed by electrons, charge them up, which makes them more mobile, more jittery, more able to dance around, more able to move from position to position. And it gives them enough energy to jump through the second layer here in the middle. The second layer is actually an insulator. Uh, under normal conditions, electrons can't move through this layer, and this is referred to as the junction here. So you have this phosphorus enriched layer and then an insulator, and the only way these electrons can move through that is if they're charged up with sunlight. So the electrons only move from the phosphorus layer down to this bottom layer, the boron layer, the boron enriched silicon layer, and that is ready to receive the electrons, okay? So there's a one-way motion of electrons through this material. As the sunlight charges it up, the electrons are moving down in this panel from phosphorus down to the boron here. Now you notice these wires that are attached to the photovoltaic cell. In order to return back to their original position, because look, the phosphorus just lost its electrons, it, if it lost a negative charge, it's become positively charged. Well, these negatively charged electrons, they want to get back to that positive phosphorus now. So they are going to need to travel through these wires in order to get there. They've lost the energy required to get th back through this junction, so they need to take the long way back. And they travel through the wires in order to get back to the phosphorus layer, but once they're there, they can get hit by more sunlight, get charged back up, and then they'll jump back down, and then go back through the wires, get charged back up, jump back down, go back through the wires, get charged back up, go back, and it, they move in this single direction around this uh, circuit here. And that is direct electrical current, it's DC current. So photovoltaic cells convert solar energy into electricity by making use of something called the photoelectric effect. No moving parts required here. Sunlight excites the electrons in the phosphorus enriched layer, the top layer. The photovoltaic cells have two layers of silicon, that top layer with phosphorus and then the bottom layer with boron, and then a junction in between, which is an insulator. Only the charged up electrons can move through that layer, so they only move from the top down, and then they have to flow back around the wires in order to get back to the top, creating direct current. You have a whole bunch of these photovoltaic cells arranged together into a module and then you put several modules to form a panel and then you put several panels together to get an array and that's how we get a lot of solar power from each one uh, of these systems that are set up lots and lots and lots of these photovoltaic cells each of them getting just a little bit of electricity generated but if you add them up it builds to quite a bit so like i said no turbine, no steam, no pressure, none, none of that stuff that you've seen with all the other forms of power. A solar panel just generates direct current by absorbing energy from sunlight, charges up the electrons directly, and the electrons just march around these wires as a result of the way the panels are set up. On this slide, there's just a couple of new solar panel technologies that have been kicked around. Uh, this is a transparent solar panel, so you can imagine uh, a building with a lot, a lot of windows. What if that building had solar powered windows, right? That you're getting electricity from all the light that's pouring in. It would obviously be capturing energy from, from uh, light as it passes through. So only the light that doesn't manage to come in would 
uh, be what's powering it. So I imagine these would have to be less efficient than the dark colored solar panels, but still, it's an interesting idea. And then uh, some solar panels no longer look like the traditional uh, racks that you kind of build on your roof. You can get solar powered shingles. Uh, these are being developed by Tesla or one of the other Elon Musk uh, companies. He may have changed uh, the names of the particular companies. Maybe it's like Solar City or something that's developing them now. Uh, but they look like shingles on your roof. I think these are pretty cool. Uh, this kind of got me into the idea of thinking about putting solar uh, panels on my roof. I realized that uh, I basically live in a forest, so the during... The only points of the year around here where there's enough sunlight for solar to be valid, there's just so much shade cover that it wouldn't be uh, a good uh, purchasing option. So earlier I gave you one con for solar, which was the energy storage problem. Solar only works when the sun's out. Uh, in order to use it 24 hours a day, you need some sort of energy storage scenario, either big battery banks or the uh, molten salt storage solution for that one power plant. Another con is that solar actually requires a lot of land in order to generate a substantial amount of energy. It's got a really, really big footprint associated with it. So just like any other form of energy production that involves you know, require like um, clear stripping of landscape or something like that, like mountaintop removal, it can lead to habitat destruction if we need to clear a lot of space in order to set up these solar farms. Now, typically, uh, solar panel arrays are placed in deserts. Uh, so this means that it's going to disrupt desert biomes. And we have this picture of deserts as being these kind of barren wastelands, but there's a lot of plant and animal life that lives in deserts. And and this is not a trivial uh, concern, the disruption of the ecosystem there. You know, any square foot that a solar panel is taking up is a square foot of sunlight that some plant won't be able to utilize. Now that said, uh, there's a lot of places where we could put solar panels that are not, that have already been cleared, essentially, that we've, we've already um, established as human areas. So for example, parking lots, right, and roofs and um, other types of buildings, all these kind of things. They are great places to put solar panels. And you also have to compare it to other kinds uh, of energy, right? Coal requires mountaintop removal. Oil has the risk of oil spills, right, uh, going across the entire coast if, if it gets into uh, the ocean currents. But in order to meet uh, energy demands, we would have to establish some fairly large solar farms, and they need to go somewhere, right? So that's one concern with solar.